Okay, so welcome everyone to Drisha and this annual Rappaport Memorial Lecture, Manishtana, the Mishnah's fifth question. Uh, the Passover Seder is the most meaningful of all Jewish rituals, and the Mishnah, arguably the most significant rabbinic text, lays out the entire Seder in Tractate Pesachim. Yet, the anonymous author of the Passover Haggadah has deviated from the Mishnah both in form and content. The, uh, the class today will enter the question, what is the religious educational thinking that drives the classical Haggadah to alter the Mishnah? We ask Manishtana. The class today will be taught by Dr. Hanan Gafni, and I'll introduce him now. Hanan Gafni studied at Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem while earning his academic degrees from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Harvard University. He currently teaches at Hebrew University and Ben Gurion University. His publications include of the Mishnah's Plain, uh, Plain Sense, uh, 2011, and most recently, Conceptions of the Oral Law in Modern Jewish Scholarship, 2019. And I'll turn this first to uh, Rabbi uh, David Silber. Uh, Rabbi David Silber, I'll- Yes, uh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so wanted to welcome everybody to the annual Rappaport Lecture. Um, just to say a couple of words. This has been a lecture that's been sponsored by the Rappaports, the Dr. Sam and Sandra Rappaport, uh, very deeply connected to Drisha for many, many years, the 22nd year, end of the lecture. And um, it's an excellent way every year to start thinking about Pesach. The lecture is always given before Pesach. This is the first of several uh, classes we'll have in terms of preparing for Pesach and what a great way to start. So we're very pleased that all of you could attend, so many are attending, and the Rappaports are sponsoring the lecture. I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Sam Rappaport to say a few words. Okay, I turned you. Hi, um, my name is Sam Rappaport. My wife, Sandra, my family, and I take great pleasure in welcoming you to the 22nd Annual Rappaport Family Memorial Lecture at Drisha. This lecture, once again, is held over Zoom, which widens our audience. The lecture was initially intentionally a Pesach theme to celebrate my father's name, David Rappaport, Pesach David Ben Yaakov Yitzhak. The lecture is more broadly dedicated to the memories of my mother, Rose Rappaport, and to Sandra's parents, Gabriel and Rebecca Sharon. My family and I are very grateful to Rabbi David Silber, the visionary founder and leader of Drisha, for providing a mechanism through Drisha that memorializes our parents and that celebrates her lifelong commitment to Jewish education. The annual Rappaport Family Memorial Lectures have served to focus our community's Pesach discussions by teaching us new points of view and giving us new insights relating to the Pesach narrative. This year's Rappaport family lecturer, Dr. Hanan Gafni, will teach us why the classical Haggadah deviates from the text as proposed by the Mishnah. Dr. Gafni's lecture is entitled Manishtana, the Mishnah's fifth question. Dr. Gafni holds a doctorate from Harvard and teaches at the Hebrew University and at Ben Gurion University. Thank you all for coming. Please join me in welcoming the 22nd Annual Rappaport Family Memorial Lecturer, Dr. Hanan Gafni. Just that. Thank you Let's so much. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you, Rabbi Silber and the Rappaport family for allowing me to, uh, to join you from Yerushalayim. This is one of those wonders of the Zoom <laughs> that allows us to do these things. And uh, what I'll do is, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna share my screen. I will start with a few words. Uh, I know you wanna hear straight about the Haggadah and about Lela Sede, but I will say a few words and you'll have to uh, forgive me, a few words about the, my own research and how it relates to the story of the Haggadah, but most of the lecture will be devoted to the Lela Sede and to the Haggadah, I, I totally promise you that. <laughs> okay, so I'm sharing my screen now. Okay, you see it? Okay, good. So uh, I'll say again, I'm starting with my, uh, my, the project that uh, I just mentioned a few minutes ago. A few years ago, about 10 years ago, I wrote a book and the book was called, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking about myself. <laughs> uh, the book was called Pshutash and Mishnah, the Mishnah's Plain Sense. And what did I do in that book? In that book, I addressed the two main compositions, maybe in the Jewish curriculum, first the Mishnah and then the Talmud. 
for centuries. We know that the Talmud is the official authoritative uh, interpreter of the Mishnah. And for centuries, nobody even doubted the validity of the Talmud's interpretations of the Mishnah. In the 19th century, mainly in the 19th century, century things started changing drastically. And there's a huge debate, polemic going on in 19th century Jewish scholarship about the Talmud's interpretation of the Mishnah. And in a sense, it breaks into four questions that I will just uh, present now. Uh, the first question was, does the, Mish does the Talmud indeed interpret the Mishnah accurately? And when I say accurately, I mean, does the Talmud indeed uh, actually interpret the Mishnah according to its original meaning? That was the first question. If you think the answer is yes, it's always perfect. So I'm, you, may, you might need to leave this lecture because everything we're gonna say now is about the cases that it doesn't actually work. So the first question I addressed there was, does the Talmud interpret the Mishnah accurately? If the answer is no, so then the following question was, why does the Talmud deviate from the Mishnah's plain sense? What makes the Talmud come up with all these uh, awkward or uh, interpretations that do not follow the original meaning of the Mishnah? And here we can think of two possible scenarios or possibilities. One option would be something that connects to misunderstanding, lack of understanding of the original meaning of the Mishnah. Perhaps the Amoraim in Babel, in Babylon, did not understand what the Mishnah actually says. And this could be rooted in a whole variety of uh, reasons. It could be due to the fact that there are language barriers, cultural, uh, cultural differences, anything that you know, uh, would not allow, maybe the text of the Mishnah was already distorted by the time it made its way to Bavel. So those could be issues that would lead to misunderstandings of the Amoraim, or misunderstandings of the Mishnah by the Babylonian Amoraim. But another scenario, another possibility is that the Mishnah, that the Talmud, the Amoraim, do understand precisely what the Mishnah says. Nevertheless, they do not want to interpret the Mishnah for all sorts of reasons according to its original meaning. Perhaps they want to adapt the halakha to what they think should be the right, or at least change the halakha or adapt it to the conditions or causes in which they're operating. Perhaps they want to do deviate from the halakha in a conscious way, the halakha of the Mishnah for all sorts of reasons, for historical reasons, educational reasons, and uh, so on. So these are the first two theoretical questions that came up in the 19th century. Following those two theoretical questions, there are also practical issues that came up. Can one suggest an alternative meaning to the Mishnah? Can a person come up with his own innovative understanding of the Mishnah? And finally, uh, in case we assume that the, the Talmud deviates from the Mishnah's plain sense, what should we do with the, what should be the status of the halakha that is based upon, that is founded upon these uh, rulings of the Talmud? Once we discover that the Talmud misunderstands the Mishnah, perhaps that should even have impact on the status of those laws that are interpreted. So we're talking about two theoretical questions and two more practical questions. And obviously they were all uh, tied up together. So this debate, which again, did not almost, rarely came up for centuries, I mean, medieval period and even into the early modern period, such questions don't even come up. In the 19th century, it becomes a huge battle zone. Who took part in this uh, battle that I'm des describing now? Well, it was everybody in Europe that involves with uh, Jewish learning. Of course, needless to say, academics or Jewish scholars were part of this type of uh, debate, but even rabbis or more traditional figures, both Western and Eastern Europe are all taking part of this, uh, in this kind of, uh, in this debate. One of them, and this I'm saying, because uh, this is a Rappaport lecture, so I wanna mention one of the leading figures in this realm, and I'm not sure he's related to your branch of the Rappaport family, but this guy, I don't know, you can tell me. This is uh, Shlomo Yudah Kohen Rappaport. He was a big rabbi in Prague, but before he was a rabbi in Prague, he was a rabbi in Tarnopol. And he's one of the key figures, key uh, participants in this uh, debate. He wrote a, his uh, dictionary on the Talmud, but also this you see on the on the screen here, his book called Rosh Divrei Shir. That was his first speech that he gave when he was appointed as a rabbi in Tarnopol a city in Ukraine that is actually being bombed right now. 
And uh, in this book, in this original uh, lecture or talk that he gave his first drasha in the community, he actually addresses this, this issue. Can a person interpret the Mishnah in contrast to the way that Mara explains? So we're talking about something very, uh, that uh, many, many figures are involved in, both more and even less traditional and less traditional people. When I started doing my research, I thought we we're talking about a few rare Mishnayot, but as time went by, and certainly in current uh, scholarship, people would say that it's not something rare, but perhaps even majority of cases, when the Talmud addresses a Mishnah, it might deviate from what the Mishnah really means, to, what the Mishnah really meant to say. So we're not talking about something rare or an exception. This is actually something very, very common. And it also involves Lela Seder. It also involves our Haggadah Shil Pesach. It involves uh, Pesach. How is that? So I'm going to say a few words that you all know, and then we'll provide a few examples for what I said. So uh, in a, it's hard to imagine in a few weeks, we're already celebrating Pesach. I'm going to do one night. I guess you're going to do most of you, or some of you are going to do two nights of Seder. And uh, the basic, the text that we read during the Seder is the Haggadah. And uh, the Haggadah is based the Haggadah was compiled, as you all know, over many, many centuries. It's not a book that was put out in a brief, in a short period, rather over hundreds of years, uh, as in a sense, as a historical layers, archaeological work. But uh, the, the basic two sources that uh, form the Haggadah are one, the Mishnah. And here you see the first passage of the Mishnah in the 10th parak of Masechet Psachim, parak Erev Psachim, or Avei Psachim, how we usually call it. This is the uh, picture from Ktav Yad Kaufman that you probably know, the Kaufman manuscript. This is the first uh, passage of the Mishnah. In general, the 10th parak of Masechet Psachim, of Tractate Psachim, is the basic the source or the, the source upon which the Haggadah is based on. And it's not just the Mishnah. It's also, it's not just the Mishnah alone, but rather the Mishnah as it was interpreted by the Talmud. So when you have the Mishnah and then the Talmud, and both of these lay the foundations for the way we, under, we uh, celebrate our Pesach. Although we want to think of Pesach as the, the holiday in which we deliver or, or uh, keep our traditions from generation to generation, but when you examine the Mishnah and then you examine the Talmud, you see that this tradition in a sense alters or changes when we talk about the shift both from the Mishnah to the Talmud, and also in some cases from the Talmud later on to the Haggadah or to the way to the current Lel HaSedil, the Seder night that we celebrate. So what I will do in the next few minutes is try to demonstrate what I said. What we will do is essentially we'll focus on two main examples that will try to demonstrate these types of deviations of the Talmud from what the Mishnah really meant to say. The first example will be more going along the lines of perhaps misunderstanding cultural gaps between the world of the Tanaim and the Mishnah and the way it was understood or taken by the Amoraim and later on in by the Haggadah. And the second example perhaps will, will uh, uh, present a case in which the Mishnah might have been understood very well by the Amoraim, but for various reasons, historical or educational reasons, they preferred to deviate from what the Mishnah really says or was uh, uh, trying to, to, uh, to, to tell us or how to, how to operate in the Seder night and come up with something alternative. So one example for a misunderstanding and another example for something that perhaps was done deliberately. So this is what we're going about to do and we'll have a time at the end, maybe we'll bring one more tiny example of a linguist, of a, more of a linguistic nature. Okay, so you're ready. First example. So the first example, uh, now, another thing before I start, there's so much literature on the Haggadah and on Lila Seder, and I'm sure that some of the stuff uh, that I'm going to talk about you already encountered here or there, and perhaps you have more to add. I will not uh, be able to address questions during, but maybe at the end, and I'm sure you'll have a lot more to say about this because these topics were addressed from so many directions by so many scholars. Already more than 150 years ago, people started doing a lot of research on Haggadah, and I'll introduce some of these sources also along the way. Okay, so the first example. So we're starting with a more technical. The first example is perhaps a little bit more technical, and it involves the mitzvah, the commandment of uh, reclining on Seder night. Hasiba, 
people say sometimes say hasiva or hasiba belila sedri. See, I put the word reclining kind of bent with italics, so you will give it you get a sense that this is the way we're supposed to do it. So we're talking about the first mitzvah we're going to address is the mitzvah hasiba or reclining on the seder night. So where does this chiyuv, where does this uh, need come up? So we're starting with the Mishnah, as I said before, in the 10th parak of Masechet Psachim. I'll read it first in Hebrew, and then I'll, I'll read it in English as well. The Mishnah starts by saying, and here we have different girsaot, Erev or Arvei Psachim, Samuch Lamincha, Lo Yochal Adam, Ad She Tekshach, Vaafilu Ani Shebi Yisrael Lo Yochal, Ad She Yasev, Velo Yifchetu Lo Me'arbaa Chosot Shel Yain. So I'm reading now in English. On the eve of Passover, adjacent to Mincha time, a person may not, may not eat until dark. And the Mishnah goes on, even the poorest of Jews should not eat the meal on Passover night until he reclines. This is according to the common translation of this Mishnah, the, the prevailing translation, and not give a poor uh, person less than four cups of wine for the festival meal of Passover night. So this is where the chiyuv, the demand to recline in the Mishnah seems to be rooted. When we move on to the Talmud or to the Midrashim, so I'll start by saying that the Talmud and the Midrash try to provide some reasoning for this chiyu, for this demand to recline in the, on Passover night, Mela Seder. So on the one hand, we find in the Talmud Yerushalmi, Palestinian Talmud, Amar Rabbi Levi, why do we need to recline? Lefi shederech avadim liyot ochli me'umad, vekan liyot ochli mesubin. Rabbi Levi said, and since it is the way of slaves to eat while standing, but here they are to eat while reclining, to demonstrate that they went from slavery to freedom. So in the Palestinian Talmud, they provide some rational reasons, some logical explanations, explanation why does one need to recline during the Seder night. And we also find a very interesting, maybe even amusing way of trying to ground this chiyuv, this obligation to uh, recline on Seder night, also in the Midrash, where they actually provide a biblical reference for this uh, demand. And uh, it, it, it comes from a verse in Sefer Shmot, in Parashat Veshalach. Uh, the Torah says, Davar acher Elohim et ha'am. The context in which this verse appears is when the people of Israel leave Egypt and they're not going straight to the land of Israel, but they kind of make a detour. So the Midrash says, literally speaking, Vayasev means to go around. But Chazal uh, make this uh, uh, play with words, they play with the words here, and they say, So they provide a different meaning to the word Haseva. So we're supposed to do or follow the example that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did to the people of Israel when they left Egypt, or in English, uh, so God let the people around, for here, from here our rabbi say, said that even the poorest Israel should not eat until he reclines. So the word Yasev, because this is what the Holy One did for them. So God let the people around, again, uh, by Yasev. Uh, so these are the sources of the chiyuv, of the demand to do the hasiba. I hope you enjoy the pictures along the way. They're from all over, no copyrights. <laughs> Okay, now, so this is, this is what the, these are the sources for the Hasibah. But now what I want to address is, what is, re, what is exactly the Hasibah? What does it really mean? So the way that this halakha was taken by the Talmud Bavli and probably by the Talmud Yerushalmi as well, was in a very literal sense. It refers to the way that a post, the person is supposed, the way it was understood, it refers to the position or posture a person is supposed to, to uh, take during the Seder night, right? You're supposed to recline. That's the way usually this term was being understood. And following this understanding, there are all sorts of uh, legal uh, debates. For example, the Talmud discusses whether Isha is supposed to do Hasiva bifnei ba'ala or Eve bifnei rabo. But the sense you get that the Talmud understood this in a very literal sense. A person is supposed to recline. Le'asev means to move, sit back, to recline as uh, during the Seder night. And the question, the, the question I want to bring up with, with regards to this Mishnah, is this really what the Mishnah meant to say? Did the Mishnah really mean that a, a person is supposed to sit uh, in this uh, 
particular position or particular way. Most Mefarshim, following the Talmud, most commentators following the Talmud, that's what they understood. And this is the way also uh, goes on in later uh, Jewish literature. So we saw the, we spoke about the Talmud, but you will see in Halakha, the Shulchan Aruch says, Kol uh, Misha any person who needs to do this reclining, Imachal Oshata Belo Asiba, Lo Yatsa. So the person is supposed to uh, recline, and if he hasn't, he didn't even meet the needs or the chiyuv of uh, eating or uh, drinking what he was supposed to. Betzarich, and he's obligated, lachzor ve'leechol ve'lishtot ve'asibah. He's supposed to redo the action again. Everyone who's required to recline and ate or drank without reclining must eat or drink a second time while reclining. So again, the halacha was taken in a very literal sense. The Ashkenazim are a little bit more lenient about this. Lenient, and they say uh, the Ramai says yes. Omrim shebazman aze the end derech leasev in current times uh, when people are not usually doing this haseva reclining when they eat bediavad yatzav elo haseva. So after fact, if one hasn't done this, one is considered to have fulfilled his obligation, although he did not recline. But the general assumption was that a, post, a person is supposed to do the hasiba in a very literal sense. You're supposed to recline and sit in this awkward position during the Seder night. The poskim even raised the question, what happens if a person doesn't feel comfortable doing this haseba? And I'm sure you encountered that feeling that you're kind of uncomfortable sitting in this awkward position. So this is another question. If somebody feels sick by doing that, and many of them say that even then he's obligated to uh, do the hasiba. And now I go on and get back to my question. Is this really what the Mishnah meant to say? Did the Mishnah really mean to, to come up with this obligation to sit in a specific position while doing the eating and drinking the Seder night? And I think the answer is no. The Mishnah did not really mean for that at all. How do we know that? So the, the po'al, the verb hasiba, doing the hasiba actually appears in numerous places in Safrut Chazal, in rabbinic literature, in other Mishnayot as well, or in other Tanaitic sources as well. Later on also in, in Babylonian, in the, our, in the text from the Amoraim, but also in, in the other places in the rabbinic literature from in the time of the Tanaim, Mishnah, Tusefa, and so on. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the Mishnah says here in, in Masechet Brachot, talking about the Halachot of Zimun. If people sit to eat, if each one is, I'm adding here, if each one is sitting alone, kol echad v'echad mevarech le'atzmo. Hesebu, then one must say the zimun for everyone. Now, I think it's pretty clear that when we're talking about, you know, a, a normal, ordinary meal on, during the year, no one would think that the point of this Mishnah was to distinguish between the way, the position one is seated. The meaning of the word hasiba just points out that we're not talking about an ordinary meal, but rather a festive event, a festive meal where people join to eat together. This is the essence of the root hesebu here. The Mishnah is distinguishing between sitting and eating on your own or having a fancy, more formal event, a formal meal. The hasiba, reclining, was probably something that people usually has, have done while having the, a festive meal. So that's why the verb was used for this purpose. But the point is not the way you sit. The point is your intention or the, 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 your idea. Uh, your attempt to come up with something formal. Also in modern Hebrew, when people say you're doing a party, how do you say you make a mesiba? But it doesn't mean that people necessarily need to recline while they're doing it. The point is you're having a fancy formal meal. The way that it was usually done was at the time was through by when people had a, a fancy meal. So they were sitting more comfortably reclining, but that's not the essence of the halakha. In Hebrew, I would say this works better in Hebrew. The hasiba is just the siman, is not the siba, right? The hasiba is not the cause for this. It's just typical that when people party, they sit in this manner, but the point is having a festive meal. Or look at the next source. The next source is taken from the Talmud and it's talking about minhagim uh, of people from Yerushalayim. It says, This is the way it has been taught Likewise, the fair-minded, people in Jerusalem, that, this is what they used to do. 
They would not sit or join a meal until they knew who would be their company, what would be their company. Now here too, nobody would argue that the point is talking about reclining specifically. It's talking about having a festive meal. The way that Khazar referred to a festive meal was using the term lehaseh because that was people what usually people have done. But the point was not that you're supposed to sit in this or that position. The point was having a festive meal rather than an ordinary uh, meal that you're having on your own. This is what the Mishnah usually means and even other places in Chazal when they talk about hasiba. So when the Mishnah says, even a poor person has to do hasiba belela seder. Did the Mishnah really mean that you're supposed to be seated in a particular manner? I do not think this is what the Mishnah meant to say, not just me. There's many, many scholars before me that have pointed that out. That's not the point of the Mishnah. The point was you're supposed to have a fancy meal for Lela Seder. The way that people, the root of the word hasibat, it does indeed connect to reclining, but that's not the essence of this halacha. And I think that there's a very nice proof for that. What's the proof? Did you ever encounter this text? I think you have done. This is the Manishtana text, right? The Manishtana, the four questions, appear in our Mishnah. And, uh, but they're not identical to what we asked in the current Haggadah of Pesach. It's another example of deviation from what the text says in the Mishnah to what we do now, but I'm not gonna talk about it in that aspect. I wanna refer to one element here. The Mishnah, uh, in the Mishnah, what we have in the text, in the Mishnayot, in Ravay Psachim, we have four questions. The first, the first question involves, So it involves the chiyuv of eating matzah. The second one, so it involves marov. The third one involves korban pesach. And the fourth question involves the number of times that we're doing the hatbala, that we're matbilin. This is what the Mishnah refers to. Now, currently, in uh, current Haggadot, in current, uh, in today, nowadays, we don't obviously talk about, uh, there are some questions that vary. So the question of tzali mevushal does not appear in today's Haggadah because we don't have Korban Pesach, so that's obvious. However, there's a question that appears in our Haggadah that should have appeared also earlier on. And that's the question of Hasiba. In the, in the Haggadah, nowadays we ask in the fourth question you see, so three of the questions are more or less, more or less identical. We don't have the Tzali question, but we have a question that involves the Hasiba. So the question addresses the fact that usually we sit in one manner, and tonight we're sitting in this awkward position. Many, many commentators for hundreds of years already addressed the question, why did the Mishnah not bring up this question? Where does this question come up, and why only in later Haggadot? Why did it not come up? beforehand. One of the people who addresses this question was the Gra, Hagaon Mivila, the Gaon from Vilna. And this is what he says when he addresses this question. He says, why did the Mishnah not bring this question? Uh, you know, I'll read it from first in Hebrew and then in English. He asks, so this question does not come up in the Mishnah. And he answered, his idea was, Mesubin lo nechshab lahem b'shinui. So the Graz approach was perhaps the Mishnah did not bring the question about reclining because maybe that was something that was considered something more common. It was not something that one would wonder about or raise questions about. This is what the Graz is saying. What I want to suggest, again, following other scholars, that perhaps the reason we don't bring the Minhag of Hasabah, Misubin of reclining, is not because it was something that was considered normal, but perhaps because it was never a chiyuv, it was never an obligation. The Mishnah never meant to say that a person is supposed to sit in one or another position. The Mishnah was just talking about having a festive meal, which was commonly done through sitting in one way, but not as a chiyuv, as an obligation. The way people sat was what it was determined by what was comfortable to them. Only later on, and this is what some scholars have pointed out, only later on, people kind of mistaken the essence of the word haseva, and they took the, the way you sit, the position, as the essential thing. 
Whereas the Mishnah initially did not even mean to say that. Perhaps the way people used to sit in meals, in formal meals, have changed. And people mistakenly took the position, the posture that people who used to sit in earlier days as the significant element in the in Lela Sede, whereas the Mishnah was just referring to having a festive meal. This is a technical example, but I think it conveys already one, one uh, case in which the Mishnah, for cultural reasons, for historical reasons, was not understood by later generations. People didn't understand what Haseba meant in the Mishnah. And from then on, it became something that we perceive as an essential element in Haggadah, whereas the Haggadah itself in the whereas the Mishnah itself did not mean to say that in any way. I'm just going to refer you, I'm not going to read it inside, to one of the most amazing books that were written on the Haggadah, already in the 19th century. It was written by a person named Meir Ishalom. Sometimes he's also called Meir Friedman. He was uh, one of the scholars in the Vienna Rabbinical Seminary. Uh, and he wrote a book called Meir Ein al Seder Haggadah Shelelei Pesach. It's an amazing book. I truly recommend, it's online, it's a short book. And a lot of the chidushim that later scholars came up with in the 20th and 21st century already appear in his book. And one of the ideas he brings up is also the concept of hasiba as something that has changed its meaning. So we're done with the first example. The first example involves misunderstanding, misinterpretation of the Mishnah that seems to be rooted in some cultural gap that perhaps made the Babylonian Amoraim misunderstand the original meaning or original language of the Mishnah. But as I said, in other cases, it could have been something that was done deliberately. Meaning, in some cases, it seems that the Amoraim, the Amoraim in Bafel, must have understood what the Mishnah said. And deliberately, for conscious reasons, they decided that one needs to deviate from the, what the Mishnah was saying. And now I wanna address a theme that many, many scholars have addressed before. I'm sure it came through your mind, but I want to bring it in the context of Mishnah versus Mara. And what am I referring to? I'm talking about the general structure of the entire Seder night. So I'm going to start with the Mishnayot again. We'll bring it first in Hebrew and then in English. And we're going to talk about the lack of order in the Seder night or the way the Seder night changed the... It's the, the core, how the course of the Seder has changed uh, throughout the years. This is not an illustration from a Seder night, but I thought it was an appropriate slide to start with. So uh, what does the Mishnah say? So the Mishnah goes as follows. It starts by talking, I'm starting, this is the, an abbreviation of the 10th parak in uh, Masechet Sachim. And again, I'll start with the Hebrew and then we'll move on to the English translation. The Mishnah starts as follows. So you start with the first cup of wine, the Kiddush. Mishnah Gimel. We talk about all the things that are being brought to the table uh, as part of the meal. Later on, you will see During the, before the temple was destroyed, so you would even have the Pesach, Koban Pesach, the Pas Passover sacrifice itself. Following the meal, the second cup was being poured. So then the son starts asking the four questions of the Manishtana. If the son cannot do it, so his father teaches him. Manishtana, Laila, and so on. Following the questions, the Mishnah shifts to the Halel. He goes on by on Mishnah Vav, they tell us what kind, what place in the Halel do we stop. You finish with Birkat Geula, third cup, you get the third cup in the, for Birkat Amazon, and the fourth cup, you finish the Halel. I'll bring it in English as well, so you see it if somebody missed something. So again, we have second Mishnah, first cup, third Mishnah, all the eating, lettuce, matzah, lettuce, charose, two dishes, the Pesach sacrifice, then you have the second cup. The kid asks the question. We start the Hallel up to a certain point. Third cup, we say the Bracha. And finally, the fourth cup, we conclude the rest of the Hallel and so on. So this is the order of the Mishnah. 
uh, here. So you can see here, you see here the fragment from the Kaufman edition. And basically the, what I wanna emphasize is that we do the Kiddush, the step that I wanna focus on is mainly two and three. So we start with the Kiddush, we do the eating, Karpas, Matzah, Maror, Pesach. And finally, after the eating, we do the talking, Magid, Chatzia Halel, Birkat Amazon, and the other half of the Halil. The blue things are, symbol, are supposed to symbol the different cups that we drink. So this is the order that the Mishnah provides. When we move to the current Haggadah, so the order changes. This is one of, you see here on the left side, the Seder, the Simanim that we say, Kadesh, Uchatz, Karpas, Yachatz. This is just one of many orders that were composed in the medieval period. There are all sorts of Simanim that we're giving to the order of things that we do on Leila Seder, Seder night, it has to have an order. But the common one that we usually follow is the, 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 the way we remember is through the one that was written, I think, by Rabbi Shlo, uh, uh, Shlomo Shmuel Plaza from, from France in the 12th century. I think he composed this list. And when you absorb it, you see, I think, this is something that you know, strikes your eye immediately. We start with the Kiddush, we do Rechitza. We just have a tiny thing to eat, Karpas. We break the matzah into two, but then rather than starting with the food, we do the magid, the halel, half of the halel, only following the halel after the manishtana and all the questions and all the haggadah, all the magid, only then we start eating rechitza, matzah, maror, shulchan orech. We finish with birkat amazon and we say the other half of the halel. So I think the striking difference between what the Mishnah was saying and what the haggadah, the current haggadah, involves the order of the eating versus speaking. In the Mishnah, the eating was done first and then all of the speaking comes later. Whereas in the current Haggadot, the current Leila Seda that we follow nowadays, we would start with the speaking and only then we get into the eating part. So this question has been addressed by many, many people. And before we try to give some explanation for this deviation, the deviation of the Haggadah from the Mishnah, and as we will see soon, it's already it already seems to have been the case by in the Talmud's period that this shift was done. I want to address, before we explain it, a few minhagim that perhaps are rooted in this change. A few minhagim that, on the one hand, were the result of this change, but also some awkward things that we do nowadays in the Seder time that could be explained if we keep this change in mind. So I'll address three type of three minhagim that are related to this shift. And everything I'm saying now is a matter of debate. All sorts of theories were uh, expressed in this realm, but I'm just giving you at least one way of looking at them. So the first thing involves the number of matzot. We use today three matzot in the La Sede, right? Some people even give them names, Kohen, Levi, and Israel. That's what they do in my house. I, you know, in many other places, they name the matzot. So uh, this is what we do nowadays. Why do we have three matzot nowadays. Why don't we just have two matzot like every regular meal on Shabbat or Yom Tov when we have Lechem Mishneh, we have two. How did we get to the number three? So here too, many theories were uh, brought up by Rishonim, Achonim, but at least one way of understanding this is an, uh, seeing this as an outcome of the change in the order of things in the Seder night. Let's understand why. Initially, probably, at least one theory, and again, I'm presenting one theory. Initially, what happened in the Seder night, probably in the Mishnah's time, we only had two matzot. And what did people do? They started the meal with two matzot. They broke one of them, started eating them. When the meal was over, they recited the Haggadah and the Halil. However, later on, what happened? The order has been changed. I'm going back to the slide. What do we do nowadays? We start the meal. We wash our hands, we break the matzah as if we're starting to eat the meal. But no, instead of continuing our meal after three, after the yachat stage, we were supposed to start eating. But nevertheless, we stopped everything. We put everything on hold. We say we recite the entire Haggadah and only later on we want to renew the meal. By then, we don't have lechem mishneh anymore. We want to start our meal. But we already, a long time has passed since we washed. We need to wash again. We don't have Lechem Mishne anymore. Some scholars suggest that this is perhaps the reason why we needed two more matzot. So when we resume the meal on stage five, we do an additional Lechitzah and we need two more matzot because the first matzah was already broken into two. 
as an outcome or some uh, remnant of the original seder, of the original order when we started the meal beforehand. So this is one example for a minhag that perhaps is rooted in the original form of the Haggadah. I'll give you another example. This is a very known question that people always address. The Mishnah says, as I mentioned before, Vekan haben shoel aviv. At this point, this is the point in the course of the Haggadah where the son is supposed to uh, ask his father. And the Mishnah goes on and spells out the list of questions, Manishtana regarding the Matzah, Maro, Korban Pesach, and so on. So many scholars ask, why in our current Haggadah, it makes no sense when you, the, the place where these questions appear don't make any sense. The, the Seder night just started. The kid hasn't seen anything yet. He doesn't know what his mom is about to serve to the table. He doesn't know what they're about to eat. How does the kid know, how does the son know what to ask his father? How does he know how many times they're about to dip during the Seder night? How does he know what they're gonna eat in terms of matzah and chametz or koban pesach or tzaliyu or mevushal? He doesn't know any of this. However, if we assume that the original Seder was different, if we assume that initially the food was given before the questions, things make much more sense. So again, if we keep this change of order in mind, in this case, it's not a new minhag that was formed, but rather an awkward thing that we do nowadays that could easily be explained if we assume that the original seder, the original order of things was different. And finally, one more very interesting uh, example for, this, uh, for the results of this shift. I'll address one interesting uh, sugiya here. I'm skipping, and this involves the removing of the plate or removing of the table, akirata shulchan. Look at this awkward sugiya. This is something that is interesting. The, the Talmud says as follows, brings this minhad. En okrim et shulchan, ela lifnei mi shomer agada. In English, one shall remove the table, but only from the person who's reciting the agada. So we hear of this, weird minhag, weird tradition that people would remove the table from before the person who's reciting the Haggadah. Now the Talmud was not clear on this minhag. Why? Why do we remove the table? What's the point of doing that? Rabbi Anai, one of the Amoraim says, Amri Dever Rabbi Anai, Kedei Shiakiru Tinokot Vishalu. The Talmud explains why does one remove the table? The school of Rabbi Anai said, so that the children will notice that something is unusual and they will ask. When you read this, and this concept of Kedeshi Akiro Tinokot Vishalu appears in a bunch of places in the Talmud. And when you read this, you always ask yourself the obvious question. Let's just think you're, you're sitting in front of your kids and somebody comes and removes the entire table. The kid will ask, why did you remove the table? And you're gonna start telling the story of Yitziat Mishraim. That's not what he was asking. It doesn't answer his question. His question was, why do we move the table? How does that relate to the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim? He's not interested in Yitziat Mitzrayim. He wants to understand, why do we move the table? How does this question in any way help out talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim? It's just a very awkward thing to do strange things that don't lead to the relevant questions. If this minhag, if this act led to talking about Yitziat Mitzrayim, that was one thing, but how, does, how do we explain this? Awkward thing, you move the table. How would that lead the kid to ask questions about Yitziat Mitzrayim? He's just gonna ask and we're gonna start telling him Yitziat Mitzrayim. That's not what he's interested in. However, I think the solution, again, as scholars have pointed out, is very simple. Initially what happened in the, or, in the old days, what happened? The meal was over. As I said, they ate the matzah, they ate the charoset, the shnei tavshilim, the two tavshilim, and the table was just removed. Why was it removed? because people were about to start talking. Who wants to have the entire messy table when we do the Haggadah? So initially, the table was just removed to point that the meal is over. We even find this minhag of, of uh, removing the table in other cases that don't involve Pesach. We know that that was the custom. The meal was over and the table was removed. However, when things changed, the order was changed, people kept this minhag. People memorize, remember this minhag, that the table must be moved as soon, right before the Haggadah is recited. So people used to move the table, but there was no good reasons for that. And Amoraim probably tried to explain and they came up with this 
exp this uh, theory that it's just supposed to raise questions. But probably initially, the reason for removing the table was just because the meal was over. This minhag, by the way, I'm not going to read it inside, but this minhag appears in the scheme as well. The tool, for example, says they bring the table, uh, they bring the plate before him, and they should shift, lift the plate and remove it, and then they have to bring it back because the meal didn't take place. So it's just causing a big balagan, a messy order. And again, the explanation for this is because the order of the Mishnah, the order of the Seder as presented in the Mishnah, was changed later on. Now the real question needs to come up. So why was the change? Why was this change made? Why did people switch the order of the of events at the Seder night? Why did we deviate from what the Mishnah is saying? And, and if you look at the third example with the Kara, you see that this shift was already done, or this shift took place already at the time of the Amoraim, because they already are familiar with the later order of things. So why did this thing happen? What led to this shift? In this case, it would, I think it makes more sense to think about it not in terms of misunderstanding the Mishnah, not getting the point of things like the word that we said with regards to the concept of hasiba that was foreign or unclear to later Amoraim, but perhaps in this case, we're talking about something that was done deliberately. One can raise all sorts of theories. Why did people feel that there was a need to change the order of things? What sort of things can we think of? So the first thing I think that comes to mind, and again, so many theories were introduced in this realm. One thing that comes to mind would be the historical changes from before and after the destruction of the temple, before and after the destruction, or time between times where Koban Pesach was brought and when Koban Pesach was already canceled. Although the Mishnah is already familiar with this, but perhaps after the destruction of the temple and when the Koban Pesach did not exist anymore, eventually might have led to changes. And why would that affect the order of things? So again, I'm presenting one theory would be, when Koban Pesach was delivered, it was clearly the center part of the evening, the main part of the evening, you eat the Koban Pesach. That was the first thing that was done with the destruction of the temple where people were eating stuff, but the main thing was missing. Perhaps at that point, the Haggadah, the speaking became more essential. Talking about became more dominant than uh, doing the actual Koban Pesach. So that's one possible theory that might have led to the change of things. We put more focus on speaking rather than on the eating element of the Seder night. That could be one reason. And if this is the case, again, we're talking about something that is being done consciously, possibly at least, it's a constant conscious decision. But there's another way of looking at it, and I think this is maybe more closer to the, to, the, to the real explanation, and that is due to educational reasons, for an educational considerations. Uh, we can think of a few things. The first thing, if once people started with the meal, after the meal, we can imagine that a lot of the members around the table started getting a little tired, especially kids. Maybe we wanted to delay the meal for, to the end of the event, not start with the meal, because then who would stay for the speaking part? But even more, and I think here we really get to the essence of this uh, shift. Let's look at the Mechilta. This is a Midrash Chalachayim. Why did this order change? Why did the order change? So the Mechilta goes as follows. Ve'higadet you're supposed to do the mitzvah, telling your children about the Yitziat Mitzrayim, about the Pesach story. Perhaps a person should do this already from the beginning of the month, from Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Midrash says, no. Talmud Lomar Bayom Ahu. No. It says, it therefore says, on that day. It has to be closer to the actual event of Pesach. I Bayom Ahu, Yachol Mi Be'od Yom. Okay, so we'll do it on that day when you bring the Korban Pesach, the Passover sacrifice. But perhaps we can do it during daytime. The Midrash says, no. Talmud lomar ba'avur zeh. Besha'a sheyesh matzah omarom unachim lefanecha al shulchanecha. It therefore says, for the sake of this, meaning you're supposed to talk about the story when the matzah and maror are on the table before you. 
literally, or at least according to the Mechilta's plain sense, I think what the Mechilta was just trying to say, you're supposed to do the talking about the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim at night, at the same time frame where people also do the eating. But perhaps somebody took it even more literal. And again, I'm not trying to say it in a, that somebody misunderstood the Mechilta, but I think somebody was thinking about the essence of this point. What is the whole point of Leila Sedim? What is the point of the Baal Haggadah and the way he wrote the Haggadah? I think he's very nervous about two things. He's very nervous that the story of Yitziat and Saim will become something that belongs to the past, to the history. He wants to, feel, wants to make us feel that we're part of the story. It doesn't, it's not just telling a story from some historical uh, experience or event. It's something that is really relevant to us. And he's also very nervous that it will become a theoretical discussion. He wants us to feel that we're experiencing, experiencing this event. And I think when you read the Haggadah, you see that this is what this whole Haggadah is about. The Haggadah is making it very clear. It's not a story about them. When the Rasha says, Ma zot lachem, we're very upset about that. We want him to feel he's part of it. For this reason, we tell every person, you're supposed to experience as if you yourself left me time. And if you can't move back in time and think of yourself in Egypt, so at least remember, it could happen. If you can't think of Pharaoh, so think of your current enemies. But this is something that we're trying to uh, fight. This is not about some historical event. And we also want to experience it. We're using all, you're using all these visual props. So you feel I'm experiencing, I'm going through the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim. And I think for this reason, Baal Agada wanted us to, to do all the talking when, this, when the table is still set. We're still able to see and feel and experience everything as we're talking about the Haggadah. It's not something that we're doing as a post-meal discussion, a nice conversation after the meal is over. That's where I put the slide with the matzah. So you see it. The matzah is supposed to stand in front of your eyes when you speak about the story. You're supposed to feel that you're going through the story yourself at the night of the Seder. If this theory is true, I think it explains why the order needed to be changed. That we had to have the meal come up after the talking. When we're talking, we're still seeing and absorbing and feeling everything as part of the experience. The, this is in, in this case, I think it's a change that was done consciously for uh, educational uh, reasons. It's part of the experience that Baal Haggadah is trying uh, to convey. There are many more examples for this. I'll, I'll mention a few more themes that if you want to expand on, you can talk about the mitzvah of Arba Kosot. The concept of Arba Kosot changed its meaning from the Mishnah to the Talmud. Another Big change took place when we talk about the Afikoman. The Afikoman also changed its meaning drastically from the time of the Mishnah to current times. We can just start by saying that the Mishnah, in the Mishnah, Afikoman is something that you're not supposed to eat. This is something that is forbidden for eating. I wanted to say a few words about this, but we really don't have too much time, so I'll just address it briefly. The Mishnah says, Ein maftirim achara pesach afikoman. But nowadays, the afikoman becomes something that we do eat. But even before that change, even when you compare what the Mishnah says and what the Talmud says, it seems that the Talmud, and many scholars have pointed out that the, Talmud, the Amoraim are not necessarily familiar with the word afikoman. Many Amoraim try to, under, try to understand the word afikoman as if it's a Semitic word, that is an Aramaic word, and they try to decipher its etymology taking into account that it comes from some language that they're more familiar with. Many understood afi comes with the word nafak, to come out, to go out. Man was associated with mean types of foods or vessels. That's the way that most Amoraim seem to have understood the word. Modern scholars, on the other hand, say perhaps this is just a Greek word that was, might have not been familiar to Amoraim. They didn't know the language. They were not... Uh, familiar with this, uh, with these uh, terms or with this whole environment, and perhaps the word itself might have changed its meaning along the way. So these are just a few examples, and I think that 
these examples reveal how important it is to be sensitive. And this is not just about Lela Seder, and it's not just about Mishnah and Psachim. It's everywhere. When you study the Mishnah and you study the Talmud, you always have to be very, very tuned or sensitive to things that might have changed along the way. Although, or even though the Talmud presents itself as just an uh, interpretation or an elaboration of the Mishnah, but this is not necessarily the only uh, form that these things go. And very often you can also sense changes and these changes help us understand not just what the Mishnah meant, but give us a little bit of a sense what the Amoraim had in mind, what were the historical and the educational considerations that might have involved the way that the, Halach, the Seder night in the Haggadah was formed. Done. I left a few questions for, uh, if we have five, five minutes, I told Evie that we can, uh, if somebody wants to add something, feel free. I don't know if I, I can answer the, all the fifth questions that you have in mind, but at least a few ideas here, I'll, I'll clear before them. We, before we take questions. Well, this is revolutionary. Now we know exactly <laughs> how to practice the Seder uh, on, on the Al Pesach. All right, Thank so you. I don't know if I have to sit there and twist my uh, torso around to be Ms. Ms. Ubim. I'm, I'm gonna feel a little bit better about that. So uh, I have to tell you, this was, this was great for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa, go ahead. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Um, I am was totally unfamiliar with this idea of they really physically took the table away. Oh yes. I mean, oh yes. This is true. We uh, we knew this from my my mother was uh, Syrian and her family is Syrian Arabic, and the the actual kaara on the table. Uh, we still have my mother's for for the past uh, eighty to one hundred years. I still have it on our seder table. It's actually very large and it has handles. And um, they actually lifted the the uh, the, the kaara and took it off the seder table and put it elsewhere. Um, there were people who told us at the time that that was how people ate in those days. Anyhow, they ate on little what we would call cocktail tables or TV tables. They didn't necessarily sit at one big table. So uh, to answer your question from a cultural standpoint, which jives with. Dr. Gaffney, from a cultural standpoint, this was how um, this was how it was done in those days. The table that you ate on was um, was portable and had handles and was shifted from one place to another. So they're talking about the seder plate, what we think of as the seder plate. I think we made it into a seder plate. I think that's just sort of lezecher in the memory of it. I think that's a great question. I think. We use it as, at least I do in our house, and in my mother and her ten brothers and sisters did it. With, we have it, use it as a seder plate, but it's large, and it for sure could have been, you know, a cocktail table, a coffee table, uh, the table. I mean, because we take our seder plate off the table, but I, I, imagining moving the whole, yeah. Table I mean, the I think table. the tables were smaller. I think the tables were smaller. I think like, you know, four, four or five people sat around the little one and then everyone was in little clutches of thing. But that's just a cultural nuance that, that was told to us growing up. Could you say a few words about the four cups, the changes, just to say what they were? The, the four cups, I think, it, the main story with the four cups is when did it become a concept of four cups in the poskim, in the rishonim, in the achronim. There are all sorts of halachot that involve a person who can't have all four of them, or what happens if you drank them out of order. And, and the, this again raises questions, did the Mishnah ever try to talk about four cups as a concept of something that needs to be done as a, a set number of cups, or perhaps it's just a compilation of one plus one plus one plus one became four. So the Mishnah said, Anishi Israel cannot sit and have the Seder night until he has four cups. It was never meant necessarily to be a concept of the number four. The number four theory or uh, uh, dominance in the Seder night might be something more that is later and not necessarily something that is rooted in the Mishnah. That's at least one uh, theory that some scholars raised with regards to the four cups. Could I ask a question here? Uh, this was just Micah. I just didn't understand if, if Misiba doesn't mean any you know reclining means uh, it's that's just a uh, it means basically having a festive meal 
what uh, uh, and it gets it because Masih Baz, how they did the test of meals. How, uh, what was the obligation? What does it mean? What is added by saying you have to have a festive meal? I mean, obviously you're gonna have a meal and you're gonna have a korban and you're gonna have uh, all these matzah. And, uh, so what, what was added? So what, how could it have that meaning think, if it? I think what the Mishnah meant to say that every person is supposed to be part of the Seder night. You're not, you're supposed to have a sacrifice and you're supposed to eat matzahs and wine and everything and make sure that you have everything you need for that. It was never meant to talk about the specific position. Why would the Mishnah at the opening section of the Mishnah, we'll talk about the need to recline and why bring this halakha with regards to a poor person. If, if the Pope, if, if it's, this is the, the main point of the Mishnah is to talk about the position, the posture you're supposed to sit, it should be bring this as a separate halakha. A person is supposed to recline. But the reason that they mentioned this with regards to Ani was the point was you're supposed to have a meal, not you're supposed to be seated in a particular way. I, I think it makes sense, but again, I'll, I'll refer you to other to a lot of literature on this. It's, again, all these things were addressed by so many people. You can't say something new about Haggadah with not having somebody already mentioned this before. So I, there's a lot of literature on the story, the history of the Hasiba. Okay, look in Aruch HaShulchan also. He has a very interesting comment on the Hasiba. So you can look there if you want to do more homework. <laughs> <laughs> do you think perhaps, do you think perhaps that under ordinary, uh, on an ordinary everyday night, not, not a festive night, that people didn't eat uh, in a group? And that that's part of, maybe it might be that simple, that in the time of the Mishnah, the Mishnah said, no, you have to mark it, mark the time, sit in a group, um, as opposed to feed the kids at four, feed the husband when he comes in from the fields or the study house afterwards, sit down with a cup of uh, tea an hour later, you know, a catch as catch can. Maybe it was only on festive nights that people were likely to sit together. And so they yeah, had to I, stay. I, I think you're absolutely that. right. I think you're absolutely right. I think it was on some nights people ate on their own and on all sorts of, you know, fancy occasions they used to celebrate Shabbat, Yom Tov or other occasions. And mm -hmm. the Mishnah is trying to make a point. You should not avoid taking part in or not take part in such a <laughs> festive meal on the Seder night. I think that's what the Mishnah meant to say. The, the reclining part is just this, the symptom. It's not the essence of the whole thing. Right. So it's not going to be, also be but, but, so that would be interesting because in Purim also, um, we have a, a legislated uh, meal. And uh, perhaps otherwise people would have run around and, and gone right, about the right. business, especially because it's not a Yom Tov where we, we cease from Malacha. Right. So I think it's very interesting that it's not only that Purim and Pesach share the, uh, the, the story, and there's a Haggadah in one and a Megillah in another, but also um, the institution, Mordechai's institution of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the, sit of the meal. Well, you also Absolutely. took Korban Pesach as Sela Bayit. You took it as a family. So perhaps this was also a parallel idea that you shouldn't eat alone. You should eat with a group. And this right. was a parallel idea. Uh -huh. Yeah, All these things make a lot of sense. But what I was mainly trying to say, what the Mishnah did not mean to say. <laughs> right now. Okay, okay, I'll send you the sources if somebody wants to take a look yes, at the pictures absolutely. afterwards. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I had a great time. Yeah, love the <laughs> thank you. This was really interesting. This was okay. wonderful. And I hope thank it gets you. us to the mode of Pesach. That's the main thing. <laughs> well, now we know the Siba, not the Siba. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's the same later. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rabbi you Silver. Thank Loved you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi much. Silver. Really wonderful. Thank you. Really thank great. You. Hi, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Gaffney, for this wonderful lecture. Thank you again. Many, many, many thanks to the Rappaport family. Uh, also, I'd like to extend uh, thanks to everyone else who joined us here today, uh, not only here on Zoom, but on Facebook and on Dresha Live. Um, our next class is tomorrow, Monday at 8 p.m. It's a class on working knowledge, labor, and Jewish thought with Dr. Uh, David Kalman. We hope to see you there. We have so many class offerings uh, happening all the time, and we would love to see everyone um, at all of our classes. Um, you can find information about uh, other upcoming classes um, on our website at www.dresha.org slash classes. And you can also watch all of the classes live at uh, www.dresha.org slash live. Again, we hope to see everyone again very soon at one of our upcoming classes at Dresha. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Gaffney and the Rappaport family. Thank you. Uh, thank you. everyone. <laughs>